I'm longing to believe. Teach me to receive. Awake my soul. Amen. Hey, um, let's check on the offering, okay? This is kind of cool because now that we primarily give online, we can like check the offering in real time. So I brought my computer here uh, so we could just look this up. Just a second. Huh. Look at that. Huh. Ted Hubbard. There's, there's Ted Hubbard. Six... $600 so far for the month of May. <laughs> Ted, uh, I think we all just want to say, um, we appreciate you. We're really, we're really grateful for you, Ted. <laughs> Alan Parsons. $600 for the month of May. Alan, um, I don't know quite what to say. I think we're all just kind of a little insulted. <laughs> I mean, seriously. You know what? Um, I think it's safe to say you can just keep your money. We don't want your money. But Ted. What? Uh, Alan, Alan, Alan. Alan, Alan. Alan, just. Alan, just sit. Alan, sit down. Just sit down. Just sit down, Alan. What? You gonna cry? You gonna cry, Alan? You all upset? You gonna cry? You look. You gonna cry? You know, Alan. Alan, listen to me. If you do well. If you do good, will you not be lifted? But if you don't do good, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, Alan, and you must rule over it. Shh. Down boy. It looks like I'm gonna need to preach on the offering this morning, so uh, before I do, let's pray. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that uh, I, Peter Hyatt, actually do not know what Ted and Alan give in the offering. I like it that way. And I ask that you would help us now to know what it is that you want from each of us. In other words, what it is that makes an offering good. I pray that you would help us to preach. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 4 verse 1, okay? Adam and Eve, so you know the context, Adam and Eve have just been kicked out of the Garden of Eden just after God promised that the seed of the woman, and there's only one, at least at this point in the garden, it's a big complicated story about what was going on outside of the garden, but anyway, uh, uh, the seed of the, the woman would crush the head of the ancient serpent, verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man, an Ish, from the Lord or with the Lord or even asked the Lord. She must have thought that Cain was like the promised seed. I mean, that would make sense, right? Whatever the case, Cain is a big deal. First man born of, of, of woman, or at least Eve, now, his name may mean spear or javelin or smith, as in iron worker. He's a manly man. We know that his name means I have gotten or I have acquired or I bought because Eve tells us so. It's based on the verb kana, to buy or even create. Cain means I create, I bought, I got. Cain is a big deal. Next verse. Then she bore again, this time to his brother Abel. Now we don't need anyone to tell us what Abel means because Abel is literally the same word as vapor. 
It's also translated futility, vanity, or, or breath, but a breath that's like next to nothing. Oh. Cain, I got, I possess, I, kea- I create, I create, and, and, and vapor boy, Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, literally flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground, like his dad, Adam, right? And in the process of time, it came to pass. Now, literally in Hebrew, it just says at the end of days. Isn't that interesting? That's fascinating and mysterious, but translators don't like mystery, so they, so they change it. At the end of Yamim, the end of days, the end of ages, Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord, that'd be like wheat and grapes. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected. He gazed at Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance, his face fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, Yatab, Tob is the noun good, and so yatab is the verb to do good, but that's bad English, so we say do well. If you do good, will you not be accepted, literally lifted? And if you do not do good, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground, the Adamah. So now you are cursed from the Adamah, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a a wanderer, a a nude, something like that in Hebrew, a wanderer you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment, that is iniquity, same word in Hebrew, my iniquity is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the Adamah. He's an Adam driven from the Adamah and from the face of the ground of his being. He's ungrounded. You have driven me this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and wanderer on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark, a sign on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Then Cain went out from the face of the Lord and settled in the land of of Nod, of wandering on the east of Eden. So Cain the unsettled settled in the land of unsettledness. You ever been there? (laughs) Chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generation of Adam. In the day that God created Adam, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them Adam in the day they were created. Now there's so much that's uh, going on here in the story of Cain and Abel, but right off the bat, we learn six or seven amazing and rather counterintuitive things. First, this is still part of the story of the creation of Adam, that is humanity. Until the end of days, it is still the day that God created Adam, and we are Adam. That's what we just read. Think you can take that literally. So number one, the story of Cain and Abel is a story of our own creation. Number two, Adam, mankind, Cain and Abel, all of us like to make offerings. Now that is a shock, right? Because you may be kind of, you know, rather disturbed by offering time at church, but it's in your nature to make offerings. No one tells Cain and Abel to make this offering. Did you notice that? They just do it. I mean, maybe your whole life is like an offering. Third, Cain and Abel bring these offerings to the Lord, who's with them. Huh, did you catch that? 
So that's number three. When the Lord kicked Adam and Eve out of the, out of the Garden of Eden, the Lord kicked himself out of the Garden of Eden just to be with them. He will not forsake them. If it's not Eden for Adam, well, then it's not Eden for God. Eden means delight. Number four, doing good things doesn't mean good things will happen to you. At least not in this world, east of Eden. Doing good things may very well get you killed. Like Abel. Like, like Jesus. So when people tell you to give money because you know like you'll get money, they're lying. Give your life and you may lose your life. Like Abel. Like Jesus. And yet, you will be lifted. If you do well, will you not be lifted? Whatever that means. Number five, we also just learned that trying to be good can make you very bad. <laughs> do-gooders are often really do-batters, in other words. In all recorded history, there's the first instance of religion and the first instance of envy and the first instance of murder. Number six, it's very difficult to know what's good and what's evil, at least objectively from the outside. Because, you see, both the fruit offering, that would be like what Cain brought, and the meat offering, which is like what Abel brought, one might be bread and wine, the other might be a, a lamb, which could be from the goat or, or the sheep. Both of those offerings were prescribed in, 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 in Israel. So it's not like God hates farmers and loves ranchers. Objectively, they were each probably worth about the same amount. Maybe, I don't know, $600? Like Ted and Alan. So what is it that makes one deed good and another deed bad? What is it that makes Abel's offering good and Cain's offering evil? It would appear that at least Cain does not know, which is surprising. Because only three verses before this, his mom and dad took the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Only three verses before this. The Lord God says, behold, the Adam, humanity, has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also, which can also be translated, take again, of the tree of life and keep living without dying, living forever, that would be living without dying, and then the sentence just trails off and the next sentence is this, therefore God sent him, Adam, out of the garden. You know, we all assume that we're adults, right? And so we know what is good and what is evil, and God just said that we know good and evil, but we must not know it very well, or we must not know it in the right way. Why? Well, because right here, Cain seems to have a very difficult time sorting it out. Even thousands of years later, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing as he hung on a tree in a garden. We did not know that we're crucifying the good and doing evil. Most people seem to think that I'm just supposed to tell them what's good and what's evil, and then they can just go do it. <laughs> but maybe it's not that easy. There's this amazing verse in Hebrews chapter 5 that I don't think I've ever heard anyone preach on or even explain. Hebrews 5.14. Listen closely. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment. That's knowing stuff, right? Discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Then the author writes this. Let's leave the elementary doctrines or teachings about stuff like laying on of hands, resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment. So God willing, we can go on to this. Go on to what? Knowing good and evil. See, it's like the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil really works. But it may take an entire lifetime or longer than a lifetime to work. And in the process, you'll die and hopefully live. 
It's almost as if there's a seed in the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that seed will die and rise within you, and then you will never have to die again. You will have eternal life. So anyway, what is it that makes one deed good and another deed bad? What is it that makes Abel's offering good and Cain's offering bad? For that matter, why are these guys offering offerings at all? I mean, does God need sheep? Does God need bread or wine? Does God need your 600 bucks? This is uh, Genesis 4. In Genesis 1, we just discovered that God makes everything that's anything. Everything that's anything. So what could, what could we possibly offer him? Everything God makes is good, and God makes everything that's anything, which means that evil is really nothing but a shadow or a lie like a void in the light, a, sh a shadow in, in the light, an absence in some truth, or, or maybe a need for creation within God's creation. Now that's a challenge to think about, and yet we all agree, don't we? We agree that God made everything that's anything, and everything God makes is good, and what he doesn't make is evil, which would mean that it's kind of like actually nothing, so what to give the one who made everything? Well, maybe you're nothing. But maybe you cannot give your nothing if you think you yourself are really something and therefore possess something that God doesn't already have, including you, and you're nothing. Oh, that's hard to think about. Romans eleven thirty five. 35, just, just believe this, or, or pay attention to this. Who has given a gift to God, asked Paul, that he might be repaid. Has anybody ever given a gift to God that he might be repaid? Probably not Abel, because Abel means vapor, weakness, or emptiness. He's like an empty vessel, empty pipe, an empty set of lungs. He knows that whatever he gives was first given to him, that is whatever is good, and, and maybe even his absence of good, his weakness, his need, even his need to believe. So, Abel's gift is literally a gift from weakness. <laughs> Vapor. Breath. He's able because he's not able. That's able. But Cain, dang, Cain's a big deal, and I bet he might even think that he himself is the promised seed, and so he himself could give a gift that might be repaid. It's not Cain's gift of, of the fruit of the field that reveals this, but Cain's sorrow, anger, and envy after the gift is given and not repaid. The sorrow, anger, and envy reveal that he expected to be repaid with gratitude, validation, and love. In other words, Cain expected to earn God's love. Maybe my sorrow, anger, and envy reveal that I expect to earn God's love. Why are you angry, Peter? Peter, why has your countenance fallen? He whispers in my soul. Romans eleven thirty five. 35. Who has given a gift to God that it might be repaid? For from him to him and through him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. Did Cain make that grain? Did Cain make the Cain that farmed that grain? Can you make money? Can you make the you that made the money? Can you make faith, hope, and love? Or does love, hope, and faith make you? We say, I made good choices. Well, who made the you that made the choices? To make a choice, there's gotta be a chooser, right? A chooser that chooses, that's a choice. 
Who made the chooser? Romans 9, 16, it depends not on human will or exertion, so it must depend on God's will or God's exertion. It depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Mercy, that must be his will and his exertion. Well, Cain clearly thinks God's favor should be dependent on his will and his exertion because he thought he deserved something in return for his offering. It must have appeared to Cain also that Abel did get something in return for his offering and that this something was good because Abel must have already appeared to be lifted. Cain talked with Abel, verse 8, in the field, and I bet Abel seemed... Well, you know, right, he seemed good. And so Cain grew jealous of the good in his good-for-nothing brother Abel, and so tried to take the good from Abel, like his parents took the fruit from the tree in the garden. Like we all try to take the good from each other, like we all take the life of Christ on a tree in a garden. Cain, Cain gave his offering for a, a, a reason, Cain gave in order to get, which is the worst kind of giving. Why? Because it's a lie. It's thinking that your nothing is a, is a something. It's a lie. Cain tried to buy the love of God, which is making God a what? <laughs> a harlot. Cain offered things, but he did not offer himself. Then Cain tried to be first by making his brother last. Cain tried to take the good from Abel, and everything got even more evil. Cain tried to exalt himself, and he was humbled. His sentence was to bear his iniquity and wonder in the land of wondering. The Hebrew used in that line is fascinating because the same Hebrew words that are used in the description of the scapegoat, remember, that's said to go into the wilderness of Azazel and wonder, on the day of atonement, bearing the iniquity of Israel. And yet, God marks Cain with a sign. Ot in Hebrew, the next place we read the word ot, Genesis 9, it's the ot of the covenant, the rainbow. Maybe he got a rainbow on his head, I don't know. But Cain exalted himself and was humbled. But once humbled, couldn't he be exalted? God told him, if you do good, will you not be lifted? That is, exalted. So, how do we do good? That's the question. It appears that Abel did good and he was lifted. The humble was exalted, the last became first, the weak became strong, the vapor got real, the little breath turned into the ruach of God. The wind of God. As I mentioned, Abel is the Hebrew word hebel, which is translated vapor, breath, futility, or vanity. Psalm 39.5, listen to this. Surely all Adam, all mankind, stands as a mere hebel. In Ecclesiastes, hebel is like Solomon's favorite word. Ecclesiastes 1.2, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanity is all is vanity. In other words, hebel of hebelim, says the preacher, all is hebel. Verse 14, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, all is hebel and grasping after ruach, translated wind. Hebel striving after ruach. That's how he describes our world and humanity. And now this is where the story, I think, gets utterly fascinating. There are at least three Hebrew words that get translated as, as breath. And so far, all of them have appeared between Genesis 1, verse 2, and where we are now, chapter 4, verse 2. Genesis 1, 2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Ruach of God was hovering over the face of the waters. <laughs> ruach is translated spirit, wind, or, or breath. The Ruach of God is the Spirit of God that creates all things. Nothing is more powerful than the Ruach of God. <laughs> Hurricane. Genesis 2, 7. The Lord God formed the atom of dust from the Adamah and breathed into his nostrils the neshama, 
the breath of, of life. And the Adam became a living nephesh in Hebrew, a living psyche in Greek, a soul. The ruach breathed into the clay. The ruach breathed into the clay is our neshama. Breath of life. Genesis 4. Verse 1 and 2, Eve conceived and bore Cain. I got, I own, I possess. And again she bore his brother, Hebel. A breath. So you get in the picture, all Adam is Hebel. Like a breath, no longer breathed. Each of us is the breath of God, having been breathed into, into clay. Cain is Hebel, just as Abel is Hebel, but Cain can't lose himself. Cain is holding his breath. Abel is letting himself go. Abel can lose himself and so find himself in the presence before the face of the Lord. Abel can breathe, or should I say he is breathed. Humble, he is exalted e even now. Wouldn't your spirit be lifted if you never ever worried about exalting yourself? <sighs> that would be freedom. I would never be offended. I would never feel rejected. I would never have anything to prove, nothing to protect. Abel is lifted, and so Cain slays him in the field. Cain envied Abel at the altar and when he spoke to him in the field because he could see that Abel was already lifted. He was happy. He was fully alive. He was righteous, which means right. It's what we all want to be right. 1 John 3.10, why, why did Cain murder Abel, asked John, because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. According to scripture, envy is why we all crucify the Christ. Well, Abel, Abel offered a lamb, but he must have known that he didn't make the lamb. He didn't even possess the lamb. All he could do was slaughter the lamb and then offer the lamb. He didn't create the good, so he didn't expect to earn the good, just surrender the good and his nothing. That means he did not give in order to get. So this is the big question. Why did he do it? Why did he give? Perhaps his giving was already getting, as if giving were its own reward. You know, if I give in order to get, I'm not giving. I'm purchasing. If I love for a reason, I'm not loving, because love is the reason. If I do good for a reward, I'm not doing good, for the good is its own reward. The best things that are done are done for no reason, because they are the reason. We love for no reason because love is the reason. God is love, so love is the reason for everything that's anything. The best offering is given for no reason because it is the reason. Like the lady that dumped a year's worth of the most costly, a year's, year's wages worth of the most costly perfume on Jesus' feet. <laughs> Why'd she do that? Like the sheep before the throne, Jesus says, you clothed me, you fed me, you loved me, but they don't even remember it. So why'd they do it? Like Jesus said, when you give, don't even let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. So ah, how do we do it? Like when I was a young father, I'd sneak into the kid's bedroom every night and I'd kiss him on the cheek. They never, they never knew it. Why did I do that? Why did God do you? Why did he make you?
I think he sneaks into your bedroom every night and kisses you on the cheek. Why? Why does he love you? Well, you see, there is no why for the love of God because love is God and heaven is what God does which is where, when, and how God is. Heaven offers nothing that a mercenary soul can desire, right, C.S. Lewis. It is safe to tell the pure in heart that they shall see God for only the pure in heart want to. People think, oh, I've got to be good to get to heaven. But heaven is being good. In the same way, people think, i got to give an offering in order to get to heaven. That's what Cain thinks. you got to get an offering to give that. Heaven is continuous offering. If giving gifts to people that haven't earned those gifts gets in your craw, in other words, if you hate mercy, well, you might as well just go to hell because you're going to hate heaven. In fact, heaven will burn you like fire, because it is fire, the unmitigated presence of our God who is absolute and relentless love. If you don't love love, you might as well go stand in the outer darkness with your older brother. <laughs> like the older brother, I should say. Go stand with Cain. And actually, your older brother Jesus might come stand with you, but go, go, go to the outer darkness if you don't love love. Go stand in the middle of nowhere and nothing because, see, that's what you have chosen. In other words, it is your judgment. <laughs> Understand, if, if God were to validate Cain's offering, what would he be validating? Cain's hell. So when God disregards Cain's offering, he's disregarding the thing that's holding Cain down, the thing that's holding Cain's breath. He's disregarding Cain's ego. He's disregarding that thing that traps Cain's hebel in hell, that thing that keeps each and every one of us from being lifted all the time. Brennan Manning used to speak sometimes at our church retreats, and I remember he used to tell this story. I, I, I've also read it in his book, so I can't remember because I would listen to Brennan Manning so much. But New Year's Day, 1969, St. Remy, France, when he was a monk with the little brothers of Jesus, this day he, he said he sat with six other monks in this old stone house. Each of them was committed to living a contemplative life uh, among the poor, so the days were devoted to manual labor and the nights were to be wrapped in silence and prayer. In other words, their lives were to be a continual offering. On this New Year's Day, the talk at the breakfast table was very animated and soon turned to the topic of their jobs in town. The German brother remarked that their wages were substandard, only 60 cents an hour. Brennan commented that their employers were, the employers were, they were never seen at mass. The French brothers suggested that this showed their, you know, hypocrisy. So in disgust, the monks concluded that their self-sufficient, avaricious employers slept all Sunday, satiated their lusts, never thinking of God, while they themselves offered their very lives as, as a living sacrifice. At the end of the table sat one old monk named Dominique Valium. The whole time he never opened his mouth. But Brennan noticed the tears running down his cheeks. And so he said, Dominique, what's the matter? His voice barely audible. Il ne comprenen pas. They don't understand. It was all he said. If Jesus spoke French in 33 AD as he hung on the tree in the garden, that's what he might have said. Father, they, they don't understand. They don't know the good. 
In Hebrew or Aramaic, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And then he said, it is finished. You know, like the end of days. Then all four Gospels record that he did something that we seem to have utterly missed. He, he expired. He consciously, intentionally, expirited, expired. John 19, 27, he delivered up paradokin from paradidomai, very technical language. He delivered up his pneuma. It's the only place, except maybe one instance of David, who, who's pictured, you know, as a picture of Jesus. It's the only place up to this point in Scripture where any Adam is said to surrender his pneuma. But Jesus wouldn't have said pneuma. That's Greek. He would have said ruach. For his breath is the breath of God. He is the breath of God. He would have said Ruach, or he might have said Neshama, because he is the breath of God breathed into us. Or he might have said Habel, for he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He came to help us lose our souls, that's where the Spirit resides, lose our souls, and then find them. He came to help us breathe, to expire that we might be inspired and expired and inspired and expired and inspired and expired continuously by God. He, he came that our hebel, our weakness, our vanity, our vapor, might be caught up and become one ruach with the living God. St. Paul says that in Corinthians. It blows my mind. He says, you, you are one spirit. You become one spirit with God. Understand, God breathed into the Adama, creating Adam, and Adam became a self, a psyche, a soul, containing the life of God, the breath of God. But a snake convinced Adam to hold his breath. <laughs> that is, possess the life rather than surrender the life. The spirit is life, writes Paul. The breath is life. But, but when we hold our breath, <gasps> It's like the breath dies. The ruach becomes neshama, and the, not, the shama becomes hebel, and then we die. But when we surrender our hebel, it becomes neshama. And then ruach, and then we live. Life is constantly offering your hebel. Life is breathing, or should I say it's being breathed, by God. And that's the utterly shocking and surprising thing about this story. That's number seven. Abel offered a slaughtered lamb, but only because the slaughtered lamb offered Abel from the foundation of the world. He lifted his head and he cried, into your hands I commit my habal. Cain and Abel's offering, both of them, they appear to have the same value, but Cain never actually offered himself, his Hebel, like Abel. But how do we offer ourselves without becoming proud of ourselves for offering ourselves and thus trapping ourselves even deeper and deeper and deeper in outer darkness, just like the worst of Pharisees that crucified Jesus? Do-gooders that do very bad. In other words, how do we humble ourselves without becoming proud of our humility? Another way to say that is, how do we have faith? How do we have faith that's not faith in our own faith, which is ourselves? Well, the book of Hebrews argues that most of us religious folks really don't know how to distinguish between good and evil but that it comes with practice, like a lifetime of practice. That's in chapter five. Then it takes, talks a bunch about Jesus, our high priest, who does what we could not do, and then that's chapter six through 10. Then it starts talking about faith. Hebrews 11, one. Faith is the substance, hypostasis, or hypostasis. Faith is the substance of things hope. What do you hope for? Jesus? 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hebrews 11.4, by faith, Abel, Hebel, vapor boy, offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Mr. I got this, I own this, through which Abel was commended as righteous. Hebrews 12.1, let us run with endurance the race, our life, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder, author, the pioneer, and the perfecter of our faith. You know, faith is reckoned as righteousness. Why? Because faith is righteousness and Jesus is our righteousness. God has made Jesus to be our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, writes Paul. Jesus is the faithful one. Romans 10.10, 10, with the heart one believes, that is, has faith, and so is made right, justified. But just as we learned in the prophets, we all have a heart of stone. And so God must give us a heart of flesh. What is it that's hanging on that tree in the middle of the garden? What is it that's standing on the throne at the beginning and the end and all throughout time? Do you know what righteousness is? It's the heart of God. It's a slaughtered lamb. It's his heart hanging on that tree. And standing on the throne and whispering in your soul. So how do we get righteousness? How do we get faith? How do we offer the offering that God desires? Can we take it and possess it like Cain? Or must we surrender to it like Abel? Do you notice what the Lord said to Cain? Why has your countenance fallen? Why has your face fallen? Cain, why are you looking down? I imagine Cain glanced at the Lord and then looked down because he had too much to lose. Too much ego to protect. Abel had nothing. I think Abel looked and never looked away from the pioneer and the perfecter of his faith. God, God said to Moses, no man can see my face and live. So Cain killed Abel, but I doubt that Abel was too upset about that because he had already died and begun to live such that he would never actually die again. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes, that is, has faith in, through, by me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So why do we come to worship? To die. To get our dying over with. When we look into the face of God, Cain dies, our ego dies. In the light of the truth, we don't create ourselves. We don't save ourselves. We don't redeem ourselves. Cain dies and Abel is lifted right into the lungs of God. We expire and are inspired. And that's how God delivers us from ourselves. The old Adam dies and the new Adam, the eschatos Adam, is resurrected. So, so why do we come to worship? To die and to be resurrected. In other words, to have faith and become the body of the faithful one. And so, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant in my blood. Now, that's interesting because the life is in the blood. The oxygen is in the blood. Um, my body and blood do this in remembrance of me. It is finished. 
This is the end of days. This is the judgment of God. This is how God makes you in his image and likeness and gives you that thing that the first Adam was lacking in the garden. Faith. So don't look down. Don't look away. Let him humble you and exalt you. Because you see, each of us is Cain, an arrogant fool. And each of us has an Abel, Hebel, breath from God, the living God. So don't look down, don't look away, look into the face of God and with whatever faith you already got. And now this is kind of the miracle, if you think this one through. But just the fact that you're here tells me that I think you got it. Even if it's the size of a seed, like a mustard seed. How did that seed get in there? With whatever faith you've got, well, make an offering. Maybe you could just say, thank you. That would take some breath. Maybe you could breathe and say, thank you for my breath. Maybe you could breathe until you realize that you are the breath of God. Maybe you could sing until sung by God. Maybe you could preach until you Realize that you yourself are the sermon. Maybe you could even try to do good until you realize that you are the good that is done. And then you'll no longer need to try. So we have two stations. Uh, the stuff in the clear little cups is wine. The stuff in the covered cups is juice, and we'll hand you the, the bread with, with some tongs. But the body and the blood is indestructible seed. It's faith. Faith. Just a second. Faith. Hope. Love. A, a, a little bit like Hevel. Neshama. Ruach. So I've asked this question all my life. What can I do? I think I can observe the creation of me. And then have faith. And so, Lord God, we thank you that we're coming home. We're coming back to the garden. And that when we open our eyes, it will be a city full of every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the earth and all that is within them, praising the slaughtered lamb who stands on the throne, an entire new creation. We thank you, Lord God, that we are coming back to the garden with the thing that we lacked when we left the garden, faith. And we're coming back because you followed us out of the garden. And not only did you follow us, Jesus, the tree followed us. For you are the tree. You are wisdom. You are the tree of life. And taking your life, we learn the knowledge of good and evil. And we took your life 
And yet on that tree, at the edge of the city, outside of the garden, we watched you deliver up your spirit. That now cries out from the depths of your people, Abba, Daddy, as we walk home, because you walk us home. How great you are. Thank you. So, this is what I'm saying. To do good, you must worship the one that is good. And then you will become what you actually are, the good that is done. You're the breath of God. You are the breath that God is breathing. And now, this will just take a second, so don't sit down, unless you're already sitting down. But my sermon was already too long, but I need to read you this, okay? Especially if you're in ministry, because if you're in ministry, you do good things and you get paid for it. It's like, it kind of sucks that way. But anyway, but it also works. Thank you, by the way. I'm going to have a vacation. So anyway, Brendan Manning, Brendan Manning writes this about Father Dominique, and, and I love this. It just, I don't know, it means so much to me. The following year, Father Dominique learned he was dying of cancer. He moved to Paris and got a job as a night watchman. Every morning after work, he would go to the park and sit on one particular bench around 8 o'clock. He would sit there in the park with drifters, vagabonds, wanderers, dirty old men, derelicts, winos. He never criticized, but he laughed and told stories and shared his candy and accepted them into the fellowship of his heart. One day they said to him, Dominique, tell us about yourself. And he told them about Jesus, who loved them tenderly and stubbornly. Jesus, who came to get men just like themselves. Thanks morning, he didn't appear on the bench. Those men began to wonder where Dominique was. They, they searched until they found his body. He had died the night before in obscurity somewhere in a Parisian slum. They found his body, and they found his diary. The last entry was this. All that is not the love of God has no meaning for me. I can truthfully say that I have no interest in anything but the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. If God wants it to, my life will be useful through my word and witness. If he wants it to, my life will bear fruit through my prayers and sacrifices. But the usefulness of my life is his concern, not mine. It would be indecent of me to worry about that. They buried him in a pine box. A little wooden cross was all that marked his grave. And on the cross was this inscription, Dominique Volume, a witness to Jesus Christ. More than 7,000 people from all over Europe attended his funeral. To be good, you must become what you are, the good that is done. Offer your breath and become what you actually are, the breath of God. In the name of Jesus, believe the gospel. Amen. Amen.